Hello, I'm Daniel Fish, and welcome to Historic Beverly's First Friday Pump on the United Shoe during World War II. Today, we will be discussing the history of the United Shoe, its place in Beverly, and how involved the company was during World War II. We have some documents from the time period that we will be looking at, as well as some photographs from the 1940s to 1960s that will aid in giving us an idea of what the shoe looked like at the time. Not every item presented has an accession number as we conducted research through a collection that has not yet been fully processed. So consider this a sneak peek. Due to this being an online presentation, we ask that any questions be left in the comments down below or emailed directly to us at research at historicbeverly.net. With that, let's begin. The United Shoe Machinery Corporation was founded in 1899 by a merger of non-competing companies. This included Goodyear Machinery Company, Consolidated Hand Lasting Machine Company, and McKay Shoe Machinery Company. The men in this picture are the most prominent people involved with shaping the shoe since its beginning. From left to right, we have William Barbour, George W. Brown, Sidney W. Winslow, J. Hannon, and Elmer F. Howe. They have been listed as directors of the United Shoe in its formative years and are listed as the defendants for the initial antitrust case brought against the USMC. The image on the right was a posting in the Beverly Citizen newspaper announcing the USMC establishing itself in Beverly and just how big it plans on being, making note of the payroll being over $50,000 a week, the 150 acres of land planned for development, and the employment of 2,500 men. The construction of the United Shoe lasted several years with an immigrant heavy workforce. These workers were recruited mainly from Southern Italy directly with the help of a United Shoe representative that was tasked with traveling over to Italy to hire locals. The signs that you see draped around those two immigrants next, ABN and ABS, refer to different areas of the factory. Building A and Building B were two long buildings at the factory with both S and N referring to the cross structures that connected them. These signs were often hung because most immigrants working at these work sites did not speak English. Work began in preparation of the shoe in 1900 with construction on the property starting in 1902 and completing in 1906. These workers often lived in Boston and commuted in by train to the construction site. They would stay the week in the shanty town by McKay Street until Friday where they would commute back to Boston. The pay was said to be so high for workers that some took the opportunity to travel back and forth to Italy from the US for important holidays and family events. With their first location constructed in Beverly, the United Shoe began expanding. They had a home office in Boston and the construction of several other factories in Massachusetts. With this, the United Shoe had begun their hold on the shoe machinery business. In America alone, they had roughly 70 factories. The company purchased patents and workshops that had already started making shoe machinery to stifle competition. And by 1910, the United Shoe had begun to spread to Europe and was looking to other countries to begin further development. A year later, in 1911, this would mark the beginning of an antitrust suit against the company that would begin and not be resolved until the 1970s. Now, factories were constructed in multiple locations, England, Spain, Germany, Argentina, uh, Laktiva, Poland, and um, several territories under Russia as well. This was usually done by buying out other businesses, much like the USMC's history with patents, and operating through them. 
some of the factories, such as the British USMC and the DVSG in Germany, had similar architectural styles to their factories, uh, though what they worked on depended really on the local market. When the British USMC was established, both the British USMC and the American USMC composed an agreement that there would be two completely different companies as per British law. However, they would allow one another access to the patents that either of them purchased for company use. This seemed like a way of skirting around any cross-continental business restrictions. As well, the head of the British USMC would report back to the Boston office regarding issues or questions. These were usually written in English. However, sometimes factory heads at other locations would send correspondence into the Boston office as well in their native language if from a non-English country. If this was the case, letters would need to be translated before they reached the desk of A.W. Todd, the director at the time. At their peak, the United Shoe Machinery Corporation leased and serviced to upwards of 95% of the shoe manufacturers across the globe. This image here is an example of the Paris United Shoe Machinery Corporation with, I believe, some leather punchers and lathes in the further back. Now, before the beginning of World War II, the Shu already had a conflict that they had to work with. The Spanish Revolution ran from 1936 up until the beginning of World War II in 1939. This poster was distributed at factories located in Spain as a call to organize the workers to advocate for better pay. The top roughly translates to United Shoe Machinery Collective Worker Society, with single command unit underneath. Correspondence during this time period would be mirrored during World War II as the company assessed damages of their factories. This included leased machinery as their concern focused on if the original leases were still going to be honored or the machinery had been seized by other people. In Spain, both the factories and the shoe machinery owned by the USMC were no longer under their direct control. Some workers leasing the machines still opted to make payments to the USMC, though others were simply told that the owner was no longer operating the business and refused to pay any further uh, costs. Now, here we can see the research division building of the USMC. Constructed in 1938, it maintains over 9,000 patents and multiple researchers to aid in developing new machinery for both public and military usage. As World War II began, 85% of the USMC's resources focused on the war effort. The British USMC was the first to accept government contracts during the conflict. They discussed this at length via telegraph with the Boston office, recommending that they do the same with the United States government. Issues began to arise with accepting these contracts as the USMC had difficulty balancing both their civilian and military obligations. One of the larger contracts for the USMC was to produce 98 million pairs of shoes by 1944 for United States troops. This severely burdened their own civilian production as all their factories pushed towards focusing on this order. This on top of developing military grade weapons. The research division during this time handled over 145 contracts from the government throughout the course of World War II. Before World War II, the United Shoe in Beverly had their name painted on the roof of their building Though once they began to supply the military with shoes and armaments, it was swiftly painted out to avoid being targeted in the event of an air raid. Now we'll be looking at some ammunition that the shoe processed. During World War II, the United Shoe and the British United Shoe Machinery Corporation fulfilled their usual orders as well as government contracts for military boots, ammunition, tanks, and anti-tank guns. These pieces of ammunition 
are some examples that were constructed at the USMC during World War II. These examples are all dummy rounds within our collection at Historic Beverly. The British United Shoe, on the other end, constructed artillery fuses and additional ammunition for Allied forces. Starting from the top, we have an M50 20 millimeter round, and below those is a, are two different M17 37 millimeter tracer rounds. These tracer rounds were used with fighter aircraft during the war. With multiple factories and locations in other countries, the USMC was able to capitalize on both wars, establishing themselves to the US government as a worthwhile company to keep around during time, these times and keep a large portion of the American people employed. This may be a factor in why the antitrust suit took so long to resolve. Now, as World War II progressed, some factories ended up having to close their doors. German troops began to expand, take control of factories in Belgium, and eventually started reaching out towards France. The heads of these factories were all English and worked for the USMC. Upon returning to England, some of them were given new positions at the British USMC. And this document lists six of the English members of the continental companies in Europe. These members were reported to have fled their factories back to England due to the war. The locations included on this piece of paper include Belgium, Italy, and several factories in France. The members on this list are primarily administrators, such as Mr. Charles F. Gardner, and some listings also include the spouse of whomever was running the factory. Be moving to our next slide. Now, this letter is again to A.W. Todd, the president of the USMC during World War II. The head office for the USMC is in Boston and the building is still standing today. Now, this letter is from the quote unquote Boston Chemical Company, that is a French company that the USMC has had a degree of influence with. The extent of communication between the Boston Chemical Company and the USMC indicates that the United Shoe likely owned some share in the company. This is not the first time that the uh, Boston Chemical Company has contacted the United Shoe, and there's even a letter regarding the confusing name that the company has with a recommendation on changing it or making it more distinct. Reference to this is indicated by the quotes around Boston at the top of the page as it reads, Company of Chemical Products, Boston. This letter in itself is about the current state of France and reports back of how the city is handling German occupation. Now, as the war progressed, Factories began to close. Locations in Poland, Spain, Germany, Hungary, and other locations further east continued to close as German forces invaded. Those that leased machines were unable to make payments during this time period, further cutting into profits of the company. As an indication of some of the locations that the USMC lost during the end of World War II, we have communications uh, regarding how to approach the new Russian government about reparations due to issues both pre-1919 and during World War II. The list that we have here shows the number of countries and territories currently controlled by the Soviets. This accounts for 12 factories with likely thousands of workers each falling on hard times due to their disconnect with the British United Shoe and Boston headquarters. If we look at the left side or the first page of this document, we can see that numbers or letters A through F, A through E are all listed as Russia with their former uh, countryhood attached to it, uh, i.e. Russia formerly Ethiopia, Russia formerly Ativa, Lativa, Russia formerly Lithuania, and so on. This also includes Hungary, Romania, and Austria. Now, post-World War II, 
employees began reaching out to the Boston headquarters, some attaching photographs to their letters as a method of provo proving their or their family's connection to the United Shoe, while others gave names of administrated administrators or the name of their spouse that had since passed. As the war ended, an influx of these letters began during the divide of Germany, with many workers that once worked at the German, Hungarian, and other USMC factories now out of work with Russia having to rely on former employers for food. With such an overwhelming amount of correspondence, the USMC began to pay for multiple care packages to be sent to factory locations and distributed to employees. Letters were sent in English as well as German, with some requiring translation before they reached the main office. This document here shows just how much support the USMC gave their employees, current or prior. The amount they spent sending food and other supplies mounted to roughly half a million dollars today. With this occurred as air travel became more expensive and the increased difficulty of transporting these supplies to the areas that needed them under Soviet control. So these locations initially that you see are in Frankfurt, Berlin, overall slash Frankfurt, and previously Frankfurt or um, Germany. Now, this concludes our presentation on the United Shoe during World War II. Thank you all for attending this first Friday talk. As any images that had an accession number below it can be viewed through our online collection at beverlyhistory.pastperfectonline.com. We'd like to remind everyone that Historic Beverly and its programs are supported by our members and the community. Please consider becoming a member or donating so we can continue to create these types of programs for you. Be sure to keep an eye on our YouTube channel for further postings or on our Facebook page and website for further events that will be coming uh, soon. With that, have a good day.